All right, hello, and welcome back to the Chase Thomas Podcast, where I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas, coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee, on another episode here on the Blue Wire Pod Network, the Chase Thomas Podcast, with Evan Swords of 49ers Hub at this time. Evan, good evening, sir. How are you? Oh, <laughs> dear God, make it in. Oof. Sorry. I'm sorry, my friend. No. <laughs> Just the girlfriend wondering why I'm screaming. Oh, okay, that was uh, there was like a whole little pause there after the intro. The scream. I didn't know if there was a follow up, and that was it. That was just the scream. No, yeah, no. I mean, you know, as we all know, mm-hmm. when the off season started, everyone knew that August 29th, 2022, two weeks away from the beginning of the regular season of the NFL, we all knew. Mm-hmm. The Jimmy Garoppolo would be re-signing a new contract with the San Francisco 49ers to be the 49ers backup. Everyone knew this. There was no question. And I'm just glad, as I have told you all from the beginning, that uh, Jimmy's still a 49er. Well, let's hold it. We'll get into that in just one second, because we also have another guest, Evan. So we're we're almost there. Theo Ash of the delightful Stay Hot Sports Podcast, also here on the Blue Wire Pod Network. Go subscribe and check that out on YouTube.com slash Stay Hot, I believe, or is it Stay Hot Podcast that they go to for that? I think it's Stay Hot Pod. I think it's Stay, Stay Hot, Hot Pod. Pod. There you go. Yes. YouTube.com slash Stay Hot Pod and uh, all that good stuff. But Theo, welcome back to the program. How are you, sir? I'm I'm good. I have no skin in the game when it comes to the San Francisco 49ers. So today's news, I could just kind of look at and be like, oh, I wonder what that means and uh, move on with my delightful day. And I'm <laughs> that's, there you uh, go. <laughs> that's I don't know. It's been it's been kind of a, a, a busy news day. Actually, it seems like there's been the cuts going down. So kind of paying attention to that. I liked Sony Michelle got cut. And I got 50 tweets about it within like two minutes. So like mm. everybody is kind of like circling, like waiting for any kind of news to drop. And then like something will happen and I'll see like 60 tweets in a row about it. And then like even if it's something little. So, you know, lots of lots of people just I'm just ready for the actual season to start. So I don't have to see all these Sony Michelle tweets and these Jimmy Garoppolo restructured tweets. <laughs> I, well, I let's imagine. get into that, Evan. The Jimmy Garoppolo news that broke today. Um, the content gods knew we were looking for some general stuff to talk about here on the NFL program here on the podcast. And goodness gracious, Evan, what what is happening? Um, the common sentiment I saw on Twitter.com is this is an unserious franchise based on today's news. That was a common, but from 49ers fans who are very much upset at what has happened today in san francisco uh, i saw one i forgot who it was uh he was i think a national reporter of just like i hope trey lance has got uh <laughs> got all the confidence in the world i hope he's a really confident dude uh going into this year and that's like his thing he, his mo he's a confident guy and is able to compartmentalize and look past this but where are you at you've got a, you've had a couple hours uh to kind of think about this let this uh settle a little bit is it panic mode now in San Francisco? Is this a disaster uh, if you're Trey Lance? Um, does this signal that the Niners are just overconfident in a really weird way about how they can control the narrative in the locker room and keep uh, keep this thing moving in the right direction? Where are you at with all this? So, I mean, I usually like to be a pretty confident person when I talk about things. I will say, I really at this point have no idea what I think is going to happen uh, some of my initial reactions, um, I think if this, if at the beginning of the season they would have said the 49ers are restructuring Jimmy Jimmy Garoppolo's deal at the beginning of the season, we would have been like, oh, okay, they're restructuring it, trying to find a better trade partner, yada yada yada, right? I don't think there'd be as much panic, but after everything that we've gone through in the Jimmy Garoppolo narrative, I think it just comes at a time where you know twitter is an insane factory of of takes and opinions and i think there was no world in which this news would have broke or twitter didn't 
collectively freak out. Not even just 49ers Twitter. Uh, but I will say this. My favorite tweet that I've seen so far, shout out to Super Scout Bros. He said uh, exactly what I feel. He said, as a 49ers fan, keeping Garoppolo is great. A good backup QB that can win games if they need. As a person on Twitter, I could not be more upset. Oof. And and I think that's the general consensus. Like we're just all over the storyline, right? We want mm. Trey Lance to have the situation to himself. We want him to be confident. We don't want there to be anything to get in the way of the development of Trey Lance. I'm not worried about Trey Lance development. Even with the off season, he struggled a bit. I'm just really not worried. It's a solid franchise with a solid roster, good weapons. He's in a good situation to succeed. I'm not worried. Um, that said, I don't, really think people have really i mean it's only been a you know a couple hours but really talked about the fact that like he could still be gone in two days like he could get traded still hmm. like this is now a more palatable well there's contract. another part of that i'm glad you brought up the trade part of it and when he could be traded because there's a certain week two game that john lynch reportedly does not want to put jimmy garoppolo in play for correct yeah and i mean like Listen, if that's true, I don't know. I think as a that's fan, that's hilarious. As a fan, I think I could understand sitting there and thinking that. But like, if if the if the if the Seattle Seahawks were like, "Hey, we'll give you a fifth round pick right now," mm. with the roster that they have, with the struggles that they have, with the issues up and down that franchise that they have. If you were really that worried about the Seahawks with that roster, it says something very deeply uh, bad about how your team is, is set up. Because I'm not worried about the Seahawks at all. If you go put Jimmy, Gr if you go put Aaron Rodgers on that, I mean, they had Russell Wilson, right? That, the playoffs last year, right? Like, I'm not worried about the Seahawks. So if that is the case, and they're waiting till after to trade him, I don't know, man. That would be weird, but. I, you know, I think regardless of anything, everyone's like, well, there's a no trade clause. There's a no trade clause. It's like, yeah, well, John Lynch said at the beginning of all of this, we will not trade Jimmy Garoppolo somewhere he doesn't want to go. We are going to be good partners in this. Jimmy's done great things for us. We respect him. He respects us. We're not going to screw him over. So like the no trade clause doesn't mean anything to me. I think now that this time around, they're like, well, we, we should probably put that in the clause this time just because, but I think mm -hmm. it was a formality. I think there's, I think there's a 0.00% chance that Jimmy Garoppolo finishes the season on the 49ers. Oh, he probably, okay. get, he, he probably gets traded. Um, is there a team that will trade for him right now? I don't know, but, how many how many teams last year had QB troubles within the first four weeks of the season? Now they it's, have a contract palatable to trade. What do you think, Theo? How do you do you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, I do. I do. I think like my main takeaway is Jimmy Garoppolo signed his deal five years ago or four years ago, or whatever it was. The situation has changed, right? The the contract they agreed to four years ago is not perfect to the situation now. And there are better alternatives to both sides. Like this was a lose-lose deal for Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers because the cap hit was so big. It was like a $25 million mm. cap hit, which is a substantial amount. Um, and But the guarantees were low. So Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, wasn't going to make much money. So neither side should have been happy with the situation going into this year. And now... Like regard like Trey Lance, obviously the timing is weird because Trey Lance just is coming off a disappointing preseason game against the Texans. If he would have lit it up that game, you know, scored twice on two drives, and then they said, let's shut him down. And this happened, I think people would be able to kind of see this as just a independent move that Trey Lance isn't, you know, super involved, like that Trey Lance's performance isn't super involved in, but because it's kind of lingering that it wasn't a great performance people are like oh well maybe he just stinks you know mm -hmm. but yeah I, I i think like when baker mayfield was in a bad situation on the browns he took a pay cut to make sure that he could get traded to a situation where he could be a starter or at least off the browns and this isn't an like for one you know copy of that situation but Still, it's like, you know, we've seen quarterbacks. They probably told him, you know, 
we'll cut you. You have no guarantees. You will cut you if, if you don't take this pay cut. You're not, we're not carrying a $24 million cap it for a backup quarterback. And we we do like you though. And we think you'd be a good backup and we've seen a lot of success together. So we will bring you back on a deal that is 6.5 million guaranteed, which in the grand scheme of quarterback contracts is not that much. And they also added a potential $9 million like in they added nine million dollars in incentives mm -hmm. so if he were to get traded somewhere he that they would inherit those incentives those playing incentives as hmm. well right so if he were to get traded week two like week one all of a sudden Tua tongue of iloa tears his acl and the 49er or the miami dolphins with all their star power are are left you know with I guess this maybe is not the best example because Teddy Bridgewater is a pretty capable backup. I don't know. Zach Wilson. We'll say Zach Wilson re-aggravates his knee mm -hmm. and he's out for the year. And the Jets are there with, you know, no quarterback. You Jimmy Garoppolo can go to that situation and make potentially $16 million next year. Pretty be he is not getting signed to anywhere that he can make $16 million. Like on the open market, I don't think he's like fetching 16 million dollars so mm. he's a good like, yeah you know so i think it's a good deal for both sides honestly you've got a decent backup you've got like a decent it's a decent deal for it's a better situation than jimmy garoppolo was in two days ago because now he's not going to get cut and he's got more guaranteed money so so yeah like in a vacuum it's a good situation but you've got so many people wondering that like oh what does this mean for lance who's going to be the starter is this really you know where's the coaching stats head where's the coaching stats heads head at that's the risk i guess is like hmm. are the players thinking that as well or do they all understand what's going on and that's the downside of this contract because i think it's a win-win but the yeah i mean you guys touched on it the distraction that it causes and kind of the tension that it may cause uh, maybe it's overstated on twitter because i i think that's a pretty safe bet but you know maybe it's not and maybe there's just a little bit more you know behind the scenes that we know but I think that it's a decent deal. And I agree, Evan, that a trade once a quarterback goes down, or maybe the Browns realize, like, man, Jimmy Garoppolo at 6.5 million guaranteed and an $8 million cap hit, we can take that for one year and hold over until, you know, Watson gets back, something like that. Like a deal like that is not out of the picture, you know? So I, I am yeah. curious, though. I'm curious to, like, does the deal that he signed, right? You know, it's like whatever mil, mil if he if he uh, is a backup and however much more if he starts does that just carry over to whatever team he goes to? Does that little stipulation? Does. So does. like if he goes to a team and ends up starting, does that team then have to pay him? Yes. Yeah. Well, so, we don't I mean, know exactly. We don't know exactly what the stipulation is. It do you make a Pro Bowl? Do you just play? I don't know right. exactly. What but we just know that whatever is on. in that contract carries over to right. so, the next that, team, right? That's what I'm curious about. Like, is it like does he start any game? Period, or like does he have to, you know? I, so I am curious hmm. about that. Um, but also but the, the one hit, thing the cap hit is less even with with or without what he does. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. To get cap hit is still much more palatable than it was before. The uh, yeah. The one thing I want to say before we end on this till the next week when we inevitably <laughs> have to talk about Jimmy Garoppolo again is if you're going to ask me what type of quarterbacks do you need personally, personality wise, mentally to handle a situation like this, Jimmy Garoppolo's that guy. Literally, not one time has he said a single negative thing about the situation. Every single time, literally since he joined from the Patriots, he always says the the media correct thing, right? Like the mm -hmm. the the professional, outstanding quarterback, good guy, you know, team guy thing. That's always he's always handled it with class. He's never said anything negative. As far as we can tell, the worst thing about him is that he doesn't text back George Kittle, and. You know, if it has to be in a situation like this where he is the backup because there's no trade partner, because things just didn't work out the way we had all wanted. I mean, I I would like Jimmy Garoppolo to be a backup to Trey Lance. Like it's it seems like we would be applauding having such a good situation 
it's just all the drama that's come with it. If you could remove that entirely and just be like, would you want Jimmy Garoppolo to back up your young quarterback? You'd be like, hell yes. Right, so, exactly. But the problem is he's exactly. still just too good to be a backup for a lot of teams around the league. Like you just can't. And I think you have to look at the context. Like, But I agree with the, like in a perfect world, if you're the Niners, you're like, yeah, why would we trade Jimmy right now? Like, we have this thing that we know, this guy who has gotten us to a Super Bowl and an NFC title game two of the last three years. We know our roster should be in the playoffs no matter what. Like, it would be awesome if we could just, like, remove the reality part of this and the personality part of it. Of just, like, we're giving it to Trey Lance, but if Trey flames out or he gets hurt or whatever, we have Jimmy Garoppolo ready to go in his new incentive laden contract that he's just going to step right in and he's going to get us back to the playoffs. And who knows, maybe make a Super Bowl run with Jimmy th this year. Like that would be the perfect scenario, right? Like if you could do that, it's just the behind the scenes, the locker room stuff, the question marks with the other stuff that like, I just, I don't see how that works for a full season. We'll see. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Like Jimmy Garoppolo, he might love being a backup, you know, with what yeah. we've heard about him. There's been time, There's I remember Martellus Bennett or maybe it was Julian Edelman or something telling a story about the time Jimmy Garoppolo, like, got hurt and they thought he could play through it and then he didn't. And then, that, like, the Patriots players, they, they said they lost respect for him. And then when he signed his big, huge deal, he just kind of, like, disappeared off the face of the planet. He may not, <laughs> like, he may not be the type of quarterback to quite have the mentality to, like, go out there and be like, I need to dominate. I need to be the starter. He might I be a guy who's fine. He might yeah. be a guy who's fine coasting, right? Like, he's, well, maybe he's like my shoulder's messed year. up. I just got surgery. I'm yeah, okay I mean, sitting this he, year out. I don't care. Like, yeah. He may make it very clear that he's like. He's he's I, I I I maybe there's a little Alex Moran in him, in him from uh, Blue Mountain State. Maybe, mm. but I but I will say this: Is he the? I have to go dominate no matter what Tom Brady type. Absolutely not. We've seen that. But everyone outside of Martellus Bennett, I mean, everyone that's been in the 49ers locker room has said he's a fantastic leader. He's the nicest guy on earth. No one has anything but good things to say about him. The only thing that they had to say is that once he got his contract, he just disappeared in the offseason. But when the offseason started, I mean, I got mad respect for that. It's very irregular, but like, if you gave me $150 million and I was in the off season, like I'm going to go spend it, spend my time with the people I care about and love. The guy seems to be a, like a incredibly close to his brothers. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, like he just him and his brothers and his like childhood best friends, like they go everywhere together. Hmm. Even like the 49ers parties in Vegas, his, his like childhood friends are with him. Like he's just always with the people that he's closest to. I mean, I can't really knock that. So I always hated that Martellus Bennett line because it's just like he was like on his fourth con, like, you know, fourth hired gun hitman contract coming over, just trying to find a team talking about how like, oh, you're not a lead. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't mean to diverge, but either way, the Jimmy Garoppolo story mm. refuses to die. It continues on. We'll be talking about it every single week whether i like it or not there you go well we'll see what happens uh next week i feel like we're doing like the whole uh tv show like the super friends next week on super friends find out what jimmy right. garoppolo does next uh in the san francisco 49ers um what also happened that i thought was like kind of under the radar today and i don't know if you were kind of hinting at this theo but a guy that i've watched so much in college that was just a bowling ball and was one of my favorite college players to watch over the last like five or so years back when Colorado was not an absolute embarrassment to the sports of college football, um, where I think uh, Colorado is probably gonna be the worst team in the Pac-12 this year. Um, so not great. Probably first coach fired there on that front. But that is neither here nor there. What is important is LaVishka Chenault, who I just love, love, love in college, loved him coming out of college has dealt with a lot of injuries, not been used the best in Jacksonville. And then obviously with what happened last year, more of just, you know, just not the best situation for a unique player like Chenault. And now he gets moved to Carolina. Kind of a surprise. Uh, Jackson was already pretty top heavy in their wide receiver room with DJ Chark now being out of the building and spending a lot of money on Christian Kirk. Kirk and uh, Zay Jones. So they're going to really, really rely on those three, uh, Marvin Jones included, staying healthy for them to 
uh, really get back on track with Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence in year two. But Theo, when you look at the trade and you look at the situation now before Baker, a healthy Christian McCaffrey, DJ Moore, Terrence Marshall Jr., who I still really like out of the slot, Robbie Anderson, Shard Higgins, LaVishka Chenault, you go through it. I like a lot of the pieces in Carolina, and I think a lot of people have just penciled in Tampa Bay, just running away with this division, doing great. I look at the, uh, the of the three question marks around Tampa between Carolina, New Orleans, and Atlanta, and I think I'm talking myself into Carolina having the best upside play of the three to have the really good year in the NFC South and surprise teams of those three. Do you share that sentiment? And do you like the fit of Levish, Levishka Chenault in Carolina? Not really. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, no. I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't hate it. I think Lavisca. I mean, Lavisca Chenault was sabotaging Trevor Lawrence last year, I think. Of wow. Yeah. Lavisca Chenault of all the wide receivers, I mean, who had like the amount of targets that he had was – easily i think the worst the worst one in a heavy workload so this is hurting my soul i'm sorry he uh he killed arizona state my alma mater and uh, he did well not really, yeah in 2018 i remember that but um I, I liked him too in college but he just is not someone who i trust after what i saw last year the mm. drops and i don't know if the the coordination and the head coaching has something to do with it like running bad routes and mm. You know, we saw guys running into each other. Lavisca Chenault was at the heart of all of that, and he was, he was the wide receiver one, or or the most you know productive or the most targeted wide receiver on one of the most disappointing rookie campaigns in in history, which was Trevor Lawrence last year. And uh, that that team led the league in drops, and and Chenault was a big reason why he didn't quite show the like dynamicness after the catch that you would expect to see from him based on what he was doing in college. So. Chanel, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I I think like maybe you don't want him as a wide receiver one. You don't want 25. I saw a Nate Tice tweet today where he's like 25% of of Trevor Lawrence targets last year went to LaVisca Chanel and Laquan Treadwell. And you, you don't want guys like that maybe mm. having that big of a target share. They're obviously going to be inefficient. And maybe like if you put them in a role where you know, he's not – forced to produce play after play after play after play and in fact it's just like a couple you know you've got dj Moore there to be the guy mm. you've got red Ro- robbie anderson there to be on the other side and lavisca chanel can kind of you know do what he's good at and that's probably more underneath stuff hit to hit him in stride and turn up field or something like that i can see him being more useful than he was before but he doesn't really move me baker doesn't mm. really move me Baker behind that offensive line, especially like his pocket presence has never been uh, super fantastic. I always think of the play against the Steelers. I think it was week 17 or 18 last year. TJ Watt had a sack and Baker was literally looking at a wide open guy and cu- double clutched it a couple of times and then didn't pull the trigger and he got sacked. And And you see stuff like that too much from Mayfield. And like, I think he can have a better year than he did last year with the shoulder, shoulder like fixed and everything. But there's just too many mechanical things that I think he's bad at to be a really great quarterback. McAdoo's offense doesn't really help him out in the way that um, in the way that Stefanski's did, which is pretty he- heavy play action stuff mm-hmm. and uh, eliminating a lot of the routes on the field. Then McAdoo is kind of the opposite of that, where it's like we're going to spread everything out, put a lot of guys on there, and get it out with timing and accuracy as much as possible without so much of the since it's so quick, mm-hmm. you know we're not going to do the long developing play action stuff. So I, I don't, I'm not a huge Panthers fan. Their cornerback room also like JC hmm. Horn is coming off a, a torn Achilles and Dante Jackson's pretty good group. though. Dante Jackson is all right. But like if JC Horn doesn't come back or, or isn't, you know, a good player right away, all of a sudden Dante Jackson is your best corner. And that's not, not great. Like no the cornerback room, I think is a little, a little questionable. I don't know. It's it's all just a little like. But I think the, the defense is line. still be pretty good though, right? Like Brian Burns is still an absolute menace. I don't I don't hate their defense. I think Phil Snow has actually done a pretty solid job. And I mean, when you look at you talk about the off the line, I think one of the things with Baker, he got hurt playing behind that offensive line, and that was probably the best offensive line in football last year. And they have yeah. the case to be the best offensive line this year, even without J.C. Treader who retired at the center spot. But like. 
I don't know. I guess maybe it comes down to what uh, Akim Akonwu is going to be at the left tackle spot for Carolina. And it wasn't like, good. It wasn't good in the preseason. He which really is looked scary. Like, like that's what yeah, it might come down to scary. for the Panthers. It's scary. And Baker, like Baker is scary. And like, man, if Burns is there, Burns is there, mm. but they lost um, Reddick and who did they replace him with? You know, it's going to be like Frankie Louvu on the other side. Yeah. Full time now, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. So it's, well, they did draft Brandon Smith in the fourth round, so maybe he gets some snaps there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know exactly what their plan is, but to me, it's just not a team that I am high on. Like, okay. I, I think the Saints, the Saints have a killer defense. I think with Jameis and Kamara, um, I think Kamara is not going to get suspended. I think Michael Thomas is going to be back. They added Chris Olave. Their defense still looks like number one on paper. To me, if you're going to pick a non-Buccaneers team to win this division, I think the Saints are like a, a much more solid. Bet. I mean, the Panthers have probably the worst head coach in football. I'm, oh I'm, man, yeah, I've got them at like five wins this year. I'm not, okay. not particularly high on them. I, I don't think the rule makes it. You could sell me on like four or five wins for the Panthers, or ten or eleven. Like I just have, if everything went right, I could see it, and if everything went wrong, I could also see it. I feel like they're the most volatile of the group um, in that division. If Baker plays like an average quarterback, like Phil Snow did, is a good defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. I think. Like Phil Snow did a nice job with them last year, and they were near the top of the league in, in yards and points allowed and all that. And if the offense can be like average, with yeah. Baker, then you're like, okay, you know, that's a borderline wild playoff team. Yeah, borderline wild card team. I just with with Matt Rule running the ship. I just don't think everything's going to Well, he's got a couple more months to ride this out, and then he'll be at Nebraska coaching the Huskers next year. Yes, sir. Um, Evan, what do you think about all this? Are you a Panthers believer? Do you like this uh, situation for Baker uh, that's uh, coalescing around him? Yeah, you know, I'm just glad that Doriel Green Beckham's getting another chance. What? Is he? Yeah. No, dude. No. Okay. Come on, guys. I'm just saying, like, LaVishka Chenault, like, he I was going to my <laughs> Twitter. No. I was like, yeah, I was, no. I was like, what? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Just, this is a uh, Calvin Benjamin, yeah. Doriel Green Beckham. Like he's just a, another person, a long list of, of really good college, you know, wide receivers that didn't pan out in the off NFL. I saw a tweet today. that was like, uh, no, no joke. I think LaVisca Chenault was the worst wide receiver in the NFL last year. And, you know, I was, I was, you know, I, I was, ex- I liked watching the film of him, like when we were doing pre-draft stuff. Like, but dude, some some guys just don't make it in the NFL, and like, this this does nothing to me. What was it? Who was the two? Re- was it receivers? Yeah, it was receivers with AJ Jenkins on the 49ers and the Chiefs traded for uh, another receiver. They just like swapped their their bust receivers. Hmm. Do you guys, rem- do you guys remember that? Bit, this this may have been a little bit before my time. Yeah, how long ago is this, Evan? I mean, AJ Drink, Jink. Oh, yeah, John Baldwin. This that is 2013. Yeah, the 49ers drafted AJ Jenkins in the first round, and he was the worst probably pick I've ever seen them make. What and year was it? No, I, 20, I have not 20, heard this, that was 20, this was 2013. John oh Baldwin. On the uh, a long time ago. It was nine years yeah. ago. But, but, yeah, I mean, that's what, like, that's this type of situation, right? It's like, it doesn't matter. I hope that LaVisca has a great bounce back. I hope it's there. I think, you know, I don't know if Baker's a, a you know, a, a starting great QB, but he does certainly come across as the type of QB that can get the ball to receivers every now and then. So, I mean, I don't know, but like they're Odell Beckham. Yeah. Yeah. He's I also mean, out there. Maybe you just add Odell to, to the group too. bring him back. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I want Odell to do this point in his career where he's like, he does it based on uniforms where he's like the Carolina Panthers uniform is a good look for me and my TikTok career, my Instagram. I like how this matches with what I'm trying to rock. I like the Carolina blue. This is going to look good for me. Uh, I, I, I like this. I'm really worried. I mean, I'm really like as a 49ers fan, like I'm worried about where Odell lands because I hope to God that it doesn't, he doesn't land on another team that ends up beating the 49ers. In the, in the NFC Championship. I, I mean, you, you He's just going to resign with the Rams and like. I want him to end up in Green Bay. Before. Green Bay is where I want him to end up. I Green Bay that would ball. that would be that would be really good for me as a 49ers fan because we all know that the Packers can't beat 
I love this. You're you on the poo poo of the the Green Bay Packers is a tradition unlike any other, Evan. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what the Packers do, year in, year out. You the are most, not afraid of the Packers. The most overrated franchise in the last 20 years. Oh man. I, Never I, has a team with so <laughs> much done so little. Yeah, have the 49ers Two. like not won anything in that time with Dude, Ooh. if if the 49ers had literally like even above average quarterback play on the last two Hall of Fame defenses that they had, they'd have two rings right now, maybe three or four. But the fact is is where the Packers had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers over a 20 year period and could only get two rings out of it, the Niners went to suit two Super Bowls with Colin Kaepernick and Jimmy Garoppolo. With Hall of Fame defenses, and couldn't get it done. That's I'm fair. taking the two. I'm taking the two rings, sadly. But, I am uh, too. <laughs> I am too. But it doesn't have to be. Ju- it doesn't have to be bad. You don't have to settle. I would just settle for more. one ring for the Falcons. Can I just get one? Can I? Can I have one ring, sir? Can I have one not embarrassment in the Super Bowl? Can we just? Right. Uh, can we do that? R- Ritter will lead you there. Ritter is it. it. Ritter looks good. Ritter, Ritter is doesn't... fine. He looks okay. You know who looks amazing is Kyle Pitts. I really don't know how defenses are going to match up with Kyle Pitts. Like, Kyle Pitts is going to be an MVP candidate. Evan, close your ears for a second. The Kittle run as tight end number one in this league is over very soon. Like, Kyle Pitts is taking that moniker very, very soon. I I really don't know how teams are going to stop him. He is unreal in the Kyle Pitts. I I think Kyle Pitts could be the best player in football. I think that Kyle Pitts could be... Number one, like when they do the NFL top 100 that just happened. Yeah. Like Kyle Pitts is the brand of special athlete that like Aaron Donald is and like Patrick Mahomes is at the tight yes. end position. It's he's I get that he scored one touchdown last year. And you had to watch was, the games as someone who watched every dumb, game. But yeah. there was a play against the Bills where oh, I know what you're talking he, about. you know, in the snow where mm-hmm. he was running just totally clear to corner. Yes. Reached like way behind him and caught it while still not slowing down, and then like stiff armed the shit out of Micah mm-hmm. Hyde and then like ran another thirty yards. I was like, no. I think one... He got hurt on that play too. He may, he slipped. He kind of slipped. He would have scored a touchdown on that mm-hmm. play, but it was snowing and he like slipped. But like I watched that and I was like, I don't know if any other player outside of like Calvin Johnson and like Terrell Owens, certainly no tight end is burning those angles and catching that and moving that fast. It's like, that is, that is some freak stuff that he can do. But anyway, this is not a Kyle Pitts section. We can make I, it a Kyle Pitts. I mean, podcast. honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm down. The one thing I, I don't want to like, I know we got a little, a little schedule and outline and all those organized things that I do. Love. You know, Evan, as someone who yeah, never well, checks the outline, off, do you know? First off, like nowadays you just don't even like, like, I mean, you did this time, but last week you just didn't even send it to me. I was like, I read it. Oh, you do? <laughs> I, read it. Okay. I read it. Of course I well, read hold on. it. It's not a new document link, by the way. You've had the link forever. It's the same link. You know, honestly, I don't have to. <laughs> I'm not like contrary to me forever being online. I, mm-hmm. re- I, I don't really. I mean, I have like a I have a really nice gaming PC that literally just has <laughs> the games I play on it. And I don't know how mm-hmm. to do anything else. Like, that's just. All you got to do is bookmark this link and put it in a a tab and then never worry about it again. Uh, But no, (laughs) the one thing I will say, though, is uh, when we look at like Ritter and, uh, you know, and some of these rookie QBs, obviously the Titans have a situation like this, too, where like every year I feel like we're looking at these level of QBs that like where they get drafted and they're always a disappointment. And I feel like we've had some like decent rookie QB preseason football. Mm-hmm. I hope it translates because like I would love to see Willis take over in the Titans. And mm-hmm. I would love to see Desmond Ritter play good football, especially after what happened to Matt Ryan. And you, you deserve happiness. Thanks, man. Yeah. I think yeah, Ritter has looked good. If we're doing it, yeah. Pickett has looked quite good. Um even Howell has had some moments. Corral really didn't, but then he got hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Willis, Willis has flashed. So yeah, it's great it's running back. Good. <laughs> but when I, whenever I think of co- preseason quarterback performances, I remember Daniel Jones. And I mm. remember literally after the first Malik Willis game, I went back and I looked up Daniel Jones preseason highlights and I watched him. Like he looks good. And I looked at all the comments 
and they were like all of them literally all of them were like i hated on this pick when it happened but he proved me wrong <laughs> literally go watch go look at the uh, comments and go look up daniel jones highlights preseason highlights and go read all the comments and they're like I hated on this pick, but he has sold me. I am appalled. Like people were apologizing to him extremely pre- prematurely. So things like like Pickett and Ritter and Willis and all of those guys, and it really any good or bad. I, I got retweeted, quote tweeted because Jamar Chase had like the worst preseason ever. He had a bad he had, preseason. He had, bra- the, he had like the, five the targets. He had yeah. five targets. He dropped four of them, mm. and then he also was like all the news out of training camp was bad. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we're, we're, I, I was pretty famously low on the Bengals. I was like, we're all banking on Jamar Chase to be good. That guy might suck. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like what I said. He might be terrible. Like what, what reason has he given us to think like he's going to carry anything with this pre-draft prospect? But I mean, like, course. at least you have that. Like, at <laughs> least you can go, hey, I was looking at drops and going, he doesn't look good now, right? It's yeah, not it, like he dropped they have any... like almost everything thrown to him. I was like, like there's we... no way we can bank on this guy to be a good player his rookie year. Or yeah, I mean, I was sitting so. there going, the Bengals are the stupidest teams on earth. They could have had Penny Sewell and they took. I was like losing my mind, but you know they did end up losing the their their uh, Super Bowl because they had no offensive linemen. So. I mean, well, they don't the get Bowl? there without. Oh, hold yeah, on. we can't. They, do this. they ended Wait, up losing. We're, we're, the you Super know what? Bowl. Because this is the lead-in to the Chargers. Because Evan and his Justin Herbert stuff, the stuff that he's been pushing, this fake news uh, oh. with the Justin Herbert Chargers. Tennessee like, is really the... getting to you, huh, bud? Oh my goodness! I can't do it. I I can't I can't handle it. Um, Evan, would you like to guess how many times the Los Angeles slash San Diego Chargers have been in the postseason in the last nine years? Uh, I would just like to ask you, counterpoint, <laughs> how many times in the last nine years did they have Khalil Mack mm-hmm. next to Joey Bosa? I how could, many? I mean, they had Joey Bosa. They had Melvin Ingram. They had prime Melvin Ingram on one side and prime, prime Joey Bosa Melvin on the other. Ingram is a Oh, stretch. Watch those hands. I mean, he was a off. really good player. People were all in on that dynamic duo off the edge. And just every year with um, Derwin James, every year with your new friend, Jason Verrett, where it's like, oh, if he's healthy, best corner in football. You go through this with the Chargers. They've made the postseason one time. There is something wrong. And I feel bad for the Chargers fans because there's something about this franchise that is just cursed. And people are penciling them in. It's the favorite in the AFC West. I'm not putting them in the playoffs. If I had to do my one through four, they're number four for me. Like until they break this curse and they just paid Derwin James until they actually make the playoffs until they host. And I'm putting host in air quotes on youtube.com slash Jason most podcast as someone who has watched a lot of those LA charger home games and Evan being in the building. Uh, I think for one of those, like it's not, it's just until it happens, it, it's just, I can't do it. Like what happened in the Raiders game to end last season like justin herbert did everything in week 18 and they still could not make the playoffs and they still were played a part in one of the weirdest endings of an nfl season ever because it's like oh we could just tie and both get in and we could do this weird stuff just kneel at every play i I am telling you evan there is nothing that is going to sway me on the chargers making the playoffs this year so i will bang the under on the chargers so when we think about this division they have the lowest floor I can't do it. I will just I say this. They have the highest floor, I think. They absolutely. The highest floor? No, the highest floor is the Raiders. How we're like, yeah. the Raiders are so top-heavy, and they're so reliant on their veterans. Dog, and just with this, dog, yeah. you are not. I don't highest know how floor. Much, I don't know how much this snowball Mike can take, but you are not. <laughs> uh, you are not in this country, on mm-hmm. this podcast, going to sit here and use the I can't swear on this podcast. I'm so mad right now. The <laughs> Oakland Raiders is mm-hmm. going to be your example when it comes. Oh, they they have the floor. I have no. a take for you. The best defensive DVOA in the division last year was maintained by the Raiders. They made the playoffs when their coach was forced to resign in the middle of the year and their special teams coach coached them. They still made the playoffs. They played the Bengals pretty tough. In the playoffs, you go through it. Derek Carr, when he is on his game, top 10 top ten quarterback in this league, somewhere in there. You go through it. They are the most even team. You bring in Patrick Graham, who's done great work in his D.C. career. 
I think this defense is going to be really good. I think the offensive line is going to be fine. Devontae Adams is going to elevate. Like they know Hunter Renfro in the slot is just devastating for a lot of teams. Their floor is so high where I'm like, there's no path to them being terrible. Like the path to them being like seven and 10 is so easy. Like I could easily see that, but like their floor to me is like 500. Like that is their absolute floor. Go ahead, Theo. I think the Raiders, well, here's the Raiders last year, Mm -hmm. they made the playoffs, which was good. And then they added Devontae Adams, which is Mm -hmm. good. Uh, they, in the second half of the season, I believe they beat a team that was completely racked with COVID. Like their record in this, they started three and one, and then their record was pretty mediocre the rest of the way. And a lot of their wins were, you know, against some, some kind of depleted teams during Mm -hmm. kind of a weird COVID stretch. So to say they were like in the playoffs, yes, but I think they were like closer to what you historically expect to be like an eight and eight team. Similarly to how I feel about the Dolphins who went like seven or nine and eight last year but were one and seven before their schedule got like ridiculously easy sometimes like with the raiders not that it's to the exact same extent and not that they're not a good team but like to just say like oh yeah the raiders won 10 games they're a 10 win team that added things like i mm. i think that there may be a little bit new, more nuance to it than that but like they have i think the two biggest ingredients to winning a super bowl which is you need the passing attack to be good and you need the pass rush to be good. And with Yannick Ngakwe and uh, our coworker Max Crosby, Max Crosby, our coworker, our esteemed coworker Max Crosby, mm-hmm. and on the offensive side, our other coworker, yes. uh, Darren Waller, and you know Devontae and Renfro mm-hmm. and Josh Jacobs and all these guys, like they have the two key ingredients. But their offensive line is horrible outside of Colton Miller. Their offensive line is really bad. And mm-hmm. on the Chargers, I think it's the opposite, where their offensive line is, I think, pretty good outside of one guy, which is going to be Trey Pipkins or Storm Norton. He won the back, he won the right tackle. But their right tackle is the one weakness, and the rest is pretty good. To me, the Raiders, you've got Colton Miller, who's the one strength, and the rest is pretty weak. The secondary, I had a stat that last year, Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes threw for, in four games combined between them, they threw for over 1,300 yards, 14 touchdowns, and one interception against the – I mean, hmm. Herbert and and Mahomes just killed the Raiders' defense. Like, like, the Raiders' defense may have been pretty good last year, but when they had to go up against, like, good opponents like like Herbert and Mahomes, they were just – they fold, they just completely well, folded. Well, the good news, though, is that the Raiders signed J.C. Jackson in the offseason. Right, exactly. Oh, oh, wait, no, no, no. That was he's the out two to four oh, weeks already. He's already oh, got the Charger stink on him. He's already been oh, infected with Chargeritis. Oh, that, that's right. They, that's right. That's right. It was the Chargers that signed the best corner in free agency. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This but, is yeah. not real. What's happening? I, the, Chargers, I, the, the Chargers had the second best offense in football last year. Yeah. And then they added basically an entirely new defensive line. And they added J.C. Jackson. And they to me, the, that they added adds, Mack. and they added like, Khalil Mack. Like, and to me, that's like two potential All Pros. Yeah, and a bunch of depth pieces, and a new guard in Zion Johnson, a first round guard. Yeah, and, and my guy added, Josh Palmer, Devontae, Josh Palmer, Tennessee legend there. Josh Palmer, who's going to be a big factor. Jo- Josh that. Palmer, who's apparently had a very nice training camp, and no surprise to me, Vilas Jones no, Jr. Over there in Chicago, Lena. It, look, it never fails to take a Tennessee wide receiver early in the draft. Never fails. I'm just we'll saying. See. I think they're. I think that they where they were not last year. I think they were a better team than the Raiders last year. 100%. I know the Raiders beat them. The Raiders fans, well, if they're better, why did they win? Like mm. it's in a one game series. You know, it's winner takes all. Like if they played that game a hundred times and they don't, Raiders fans, I get it. You won and you'll have great bragging rights forever for that. But but the, if you had to bet on it, though, Max or Max and Chandler Jones and practicality oh. and pressures and sacks next year, if you had to guess, or it's Joey Bosa and Cleo Mack, who do you think is more productive over a 17-game series season? Joey Bosa. Do you? Doug, what are we do doing? It. Can't do it. I don't think first it's going to be close. We're going to revisit this. I'm going to save this sound. Here, We're going to revisit this. I, I, I just... The theoretical chargers needs to end. I can't do the theoretical chargers anymore. 
Okay. In that, last year, I so, hated the Chargers. Last year, I really didn't like them when everyone mm. had them as wild card teams. Yes. I said this defense is Bosa and Derwin, and there's mm. no one else. They have no interior defensive linemen. They went through the most drastic scheme shift in the league in terms of like a guy who exclusively stacked the box and played one high to a guy mm. who exclusively plays two high and has light boxes. So they didn't have anyone who could two gap. They didn't have any number one corner. They didn't have any of that. And people were like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a this could be a top you know a lock as a wild card team and it's going to contend with the chiefs mm. no they weren't they never were last year the defense got so overrated so i didn't like them last year but they still kind of outperformed my expectations because herbert was just so stinking good last year and now this year they've got the defense that everybody like this is the defense this is what you're looking for this is when you've added sebastian joseph day khalil mack and uh austin jackson i can't remember the other name of their nose tackle that they got those three can actually Austin do Johnson. what Austin Johnson, close. Uh, those three are actually the linemen that you want to run this. You actually have a number one corner. Maybe you don't for the first four weeks, and maybe they lose a game because of that. But like the safety duo, the cornerback room, they added um, Bryce Callahan, who's a good slot guy. They've got another year of growth from Asante Samuel Jr. You've got one of the scariest edge rushing duos in a long time combined with better guys in the middle. You've got, you know, a a decent offensive line. You've got weapons. You've got this historically good quarterback. Like to me, curse or no curse. And it's not like the Raiders are like the most historically. Like yeah, if we're exactly. just going about like unlucky franchises, the Raiders last year. Had no, maybe yeah, the, notable team I guess to really still go the ahead play. and make it happen. The, the Oakland Raiders. By the way, the, you act like losing the head coach for the Raiders last year was like some like triumphant hurdle to climb. They got better because they had a better coach coaching. That's the. I, but what no, I'm no, no. saying is that was weird. That could have no. easily torpedoed a yeah, season. Yeah. yeah, but when you're when the guy lighting your kitchen on fire leaves, you shouldn't be surprised that the kitchen's no longer on fire. Well, I also think Rich should get a head coaching job at some point. Sure. Like he's, yeah, he's proved, he's I don't understand why he's he hasn't gotten a better. I don't know why they didn't give him a serious look anyway. Uh, Here, after here's some here's some here's some some one liners. Mm. Mike Williams and Justin Herbert will have more yards and touchdowns this this season. Than Derek Carr and Devontae Adams. Mm. Joey Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack will have more sacks than the the starting corner the starting uh, edge no rushers way. for the Raiders. No way. Absolutely, one hundred percent. The the one thing that I love Theo about is because he's so much smarter than than most people. He just casually slips in that Asante Samuel is quite literally maybe the best overall draft pick last year. Maybe he was absolutely fantastic last year, and now he's uh, going into his second year. He's going to just get even better while also playing next to JC Jackson. Like they have players on rookie contracts playing at high, at uh, like top tier high levels. Like it's just mm. you, you. I understand the premise of the Chargers curse, and it was real for a very long time, but it was very real with Philip Rivers, and I think the curse was probably just dying. And like a last like little like, you know, like viruses tend to do right. That last little reach probably got Justin Herbert, you know, at the end of the season last year. But I think the curse is dead and you have what could be the best roster in the NFL this year with what very well could be the best quarterback in the entire NFL this year. The one I do the most classic Chargers curse moment of all time for me was I was watching a Chargers game. I can't remember who it is against. Um, and I had a friend from San Diego and once the chargers left, he, he cast them away. He hated them after, after Spanos left and he became a Rams fan. And there were, there's a bunch of people from San Diego, California who went to Arizona state. So we were all watching mm -hmm. the chargers game with lots of chargers fans and they had it in the bag and they were on the one yard line and all they needed to do was punch it in. And my Rams, my now Rams fan friend was like, somehow they're going to mess it. I don't know how they're going to mess it up, but they're going to mess it up. Like, there's just no way they win this game, even though there was a 99% chance they did. And like, while reaching over the goal line, Melvin Gordon fumbles. <laughs> and I they may have been playing the Raiders and I can, but then the other team recovers mm. and they lose. They just lost a game that was absolutely in the bag. And my former Chargers fan friend just like, would not stop saying they were going to blow it all the way as they marched down the field. And it looks like they had everything locked up. 
and they still managed to blow it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's something you can, I always talk, I'm from Minnesota, but I'm a Packers fan. I always talk about how Minnesota sports will, uh, let you down eventually mm. if they will. Uh, but you know, even with that being said, I've still seen the Vikings go to the, you know, NFC championship game where they got shellacked by the Eagles, but you know, the Vikings are an extremely cursed franchise and yep. that doesn't mean that might mean maybe the, maybe the, the, it'll, it'll pop up deep in the playoffs. Like it does for the Packers every single year. But to me, the Chargers are a loaded roster, top to bottom. I, every skill position, you like quarterback, all the units, quarterback, skill position, offensive line, front seven, secondary. I mean, we got stars. We got potential all pros on every level. So it's like, dang, I, I, I don't know if there's a roster out there that's more complete than that. So you curse well. or no curse, I'm taking we could say there is one team potentially more developed and that more deep, and that's the Chiefs, right? Like they they move on from Tyreek Hill. I think they're my pick right now to win this division. Um, I think we have to group the Chiefs and the Broncos together because I think the Broncos are either like the best team in this division this year, and like Russell bounces back and he's immediately at the MVP Russ that we saw a couple of years ago. Or it's like, oh, the Seahawks knew something and that this is actually over. And the rest that we saw go to the Super Bowl and that MVP type rest, let Russ cook stuff is over. And the Broncos are now locked in with this guy. Um, Tim Patrick out for the year, uh, relying a lot on Melvin Gordon in 2022 and what he does for them. Like, we'll see Jerry Judy. Can he finally come through on his uh, first round pedigree? Like, is that a thing? Or is it all over? And they like just this completely backfires. Like, I don't think there's any middle ground. Like the rate, the, the Broncos go eight and eight. I think they're either the best team in this division and they go like 13 and four. Or I think this is a disaster and they're like six and 11 and the Broncos are like, oh my God, we made a huge mistake with uh, Russell Wilson. The Chiefs, though, are the same way. We're like, I just, I think the Chiefs have to go into this year with the, the upside of like, they have the best odds winning this division. I think people are probably over analyzing moving up losing Tyreek Hill I think Juju is a great scheme fit for what Kansas City wants to do and I think Patrick Mahomes and Juju are going to be uh simpatico in a lot of ways um George Kalaftist the defensive end from uh Purdue is tearing it up in preseason I think he's going to be an immediate uh monster on the edge for KC but you just look at it and you're like, I don't know, Sky Moore will probably be fine for them. I'm, I would not be surprised if he's really great. Like your old friend, uh, Theo, you get Marquez uh, about a scantling. He's in the building. Travis Kelsey, still there. Um, I just, I think this defense is going to be a little bit better. And I just, I look at Patrick Mahomes and what happened to him in the playoffs and what happened to him in that Cincy game and just the picks and what he was doing and just, not having to worry about finding Tyree kill, I think will actually develop something else in his game. I think the best is still in front of Patrick Mahomes. And I think he's going to look at this year as proving a lot of people wrong in terms of like, ah, Ty- I need Tyree kill to get to that next level. I think he's going to push back and get even better. Like they're, they're my favorite. What do you think? I like them. I think about like what Mahomes did his, his rookie or not his rookie year, his second year when he won MVP and, I mean, the year before that, they were starting Alex Smith, okay? And mm. when you think about Alex Smith and Andy Reid, I mean, you don't exactly – Hey, I'm not saying it. No I'm just to Alex I'm Smith. Just I'm just but the style of quarterback that he is, is is a little bit more precise. He's a little bit more, you know, in structure. He's not someone who's going to be – So it's not like Andy Reid all of a sudden had Mahomes and said, we're going to go full, like, balls-to-the-wall crazy down the field stuff. No, his first year in the league, there was still, like – you know, remnants of, of that Alex Smith type of like offense and that kind of like mentality around like how they want to put points on the board. And it was a little bit more structured. And that's when Mahomes had his best season. That's when he was so historically good. I think everybody is like, oh, Mahomes is inaccurate. He's not poised. I think they're in for a very rude awakening when they find that without Tyreek Hill, they're going to say, let's, that got crazy last year. We tried to hit the home run every play, especially because mm. their defense was so historically bad at the beginning of last year. I mean, they were the worst defense in football through the eight, first eight weeks. So, like, with that, pre- with Mahomes knowing that and just kind of the deterioration of, like, structure over the years, 
it kind of just turned into like this, we need to go, like we can hit home runs. We're going to hit home runs and we need to. And it, it, it made for messy football. But that's not just all, that's not all Patrick Mahomes can do. You know, that's not, I, that, it hasn't looked like that for three straight years. You know, it's been, it looked like a little bit of a, and even the deterioration was still a bit, an offense that was number one in yards per drive and number one in points per drive. They were the best offense last year. So to say a deterioration is like a little weird, but I mean, you could see it a little bit and like, it was a little bit more of a struggle than it has been. And I think they're going to say like, let's calm down. We're going to take a step back. We're going to go under center. There's going to be more play action. There's going to be more running, right? Cause last year against the Bengals, the Bengals were dropping eight into coverage, like all of that playoff game. And instead of just running the football, they still continue to try to bomb it down the field this year. They're like, we're going to run the football more. We're mm-hmm. going to play, you know, I, I formation under center. We're going to do all this stuff. It's going to be precise. It's going to be timing. And Mahomes is going to be able to be, be like, he's the best quarterback in the world. You know, he's, he's going to be able they're to going back to that. the Andy Reid Philadelphia Eagles years, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. And, and like that team got to the Super Bowl with Donovan mm-hmm. McNabb. All right. And really Donovan good during McNabb those big and, years. Yeah. Like, and really good during those big years. Like Mahomes, Mahomes can do all of that and more. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the offense I'm not worried about. And that might be the team with the highest floor just because hmm. even with Tyreek Hill gone, Mahomes behind a very good offensive line. With Maybe Andy the best Reed in football. And Travis, yeah, with Travis Kelsey, Andy Reid, Mahomes, good offensive line. And the wide receiving core, you've got guys that are, can stretch the field uh, in Marquez Valdez Scantling and Nico Hardman. Can they punish? Like, you should not hit as many deep shots as the Chiefs have been hitting over the past three years, right? There's a lot of times when someone will take the top off the defense and all they're there to do is take the top off the defense so the underneath guys can eat, right? Like, that's how normally it works is like a clear out. Mahomes mm. and Tyree Kill could like hit the clear outs, which is weird. But in the design of the play, like underneath, like just because that's not there and that flash isn't there doesn't mean they can't march up and down the field with, you know, Marquez Valdez Scantling taking the top off the defense and, um, you know, Kelsey and, and Juju eating underneath and from what that creates. So, yeah, it's going to be a great offense. The defense concerns me a little bit just because the defense was not very good last year, even though they did turn it around a little bit. They did get torched by Josh Allen at the end of the season. They did get torched by Jamar Chase at the end of the season. And then they lost Tyron Matthew. They lost Chardavious Chardavious Ward, who were like two of their best secondary players. So, you know, I did love their draft. But, you know, the the difference between a good rookie prospect and like an impact starter right away is kind of a big gap. So I do worry about the defense a little bit. And I worry about their schedule, which is like the hardest I have ever, ever seen. Um, but as far as like the offense goes and as far as their floor goes, um, no reason to believe this can't be a top five offense again. Pretty easily. I mean, they have the hardest division in, or hardest schedule in football and the Raiders are right there too. We should mention both are in the top three in strength of schedule per sharp football analysis. And I think your point is well taken, especially in the, the secondary where this was the worst secondary uh, by far in the division last year. And you can make the case that the secondary got worse uh, this year, like Trent McDuffie. Uh, I hope you're good. Like you're, you're getting thrown to the fire. You better be AJ Terrell right away because they are. And AJ Terrell stunk right away. He's, he, he wasn't good his rookie year. And then he no. broke out the second rookie corners are a little bit. It's hard. Bank on. It's the hardest position. Yeah. So we'll Evan, see. what do you think when you look at the Chiefs? Are they your favorite in this division? And do you have any serious question marks post Terry Kill? Are they going to come to regret just not paying him and keeping him around? Uh, I, I mean, they're obviously not my favorite because you know, the Chargers are going to win uh, okay. the, the AFC. Mm-hmm. But um, the AFC I, as a whole. I, well, I, I mean, regardless, I do think the winner of the AFC, AFC is coming out of this division. And I don't think that's hmm. some absurd thing. Not only is are, are they three of the best teams in the NFL, but they all have to beat the crap out of each other all season long. And like, I do think there's something to say. I have, if you, if you can get away from injuries, playing the best teams all season long is going to prepare you in the playoffs. If, uh, if I, the chiefs win this division with that schedule, like the, yeah. the, they're a juggernaut and they're going to cake walk through the playoffs. Like if they look like the best team with this schedule, like, yeah, yeah they're winning the Super Bowl. Cause they're, like, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, we saw what happens when they played the, when they won their Super Bowl, it's similar. The one thing that I really like about the AFC West is that they are 
that there's three teams in there that are to me all of equal to like if I had to rank them, I I I would definitely have the Chargers and Chiefs one A, one B. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would almost say one C with the Broncos, but like your point with Russ, we do need to kind of maybe see. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, you know, I've watched Russell Wilson ruin my hopes and dreams for a decade, so I'm not betting against him <laughs> yet. But I I love it. Like the Broncos are gonna are as good as they are, but they traded to get Russell Wilson. Right, mm-hmm. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs are the same powerhouse that they've been since Mahomes got drafted, and Justin Herbert and the Chargers are kind of like this, like you know, new kid on the block, like chasing heavily, chasing down the other teams. Like they're all unique in their own stories. None of them are the same. And to me, that they they're all heavyweights swinging at each other. So like, I'm really excited to watch. I don't usually really watch the AFC too much in the, in the regular season as you know, when watching the NFC West living on the West coast. Um, but I'm really excited for this division. And I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I, I think Tyree kill, you know, how, how good Tyree kill is when you see Tua throwing, you know, 55 yard bombs. I mean, I wouldn't say call them bombs, but like mm. it just shows to the point of like how special Tyreek Hill is and how how good of a receiver it is. MVS is not going to recreate that with the Chiefs. I don't think he needs to because Patrick Mahomes is probably still the best quarterback in the in the NFL. But you know, point plain and simple, like they they're not they're not going to recreate Tyreek Hill. So that's what I'll be most curious about. But like you know, like Theo said, there's a lot of things that they've done this off season to really, I guess, kind of like fortify the walls. So I feel like this, a- the choice to move on from Hill, because I think Patrick Mahomes has a lot of say in everything that they're doing. I just, I, I think he okayed that. And I look at it as he's entered the career where it's like, I think two things can be true. And I think this is something that a lot of teams should look at. And the Falcons are doing this with Kyle Pitts and Drake London. And I think a lot of teams have figured this out. Jam pack these rookie quarterbacks with as much talent around them as humanly possible to build up their confidence to get those safety nets so that their acclimation to the nfl is as seamless as possible but then there comes a certain point where there's like diminishing returns where you're like okay this guy is just looking for this guy he's trusted for years and years now that like there's this expectation that he's going to go find him and the tyreek hill was remember he was annoyed on the sidelines remember him having those breakdowns and being frustrated with not getting the ball and yelling at patrick mahomes like there was a disconnect there uh, at times last year where I think at this point, you you saw it with Brady and you see it with a lot of these quarterbacks. I think at a certain point, once it's like established, it might be better like the Aaron Rodgers of the world where it's like, I actually kind of want need to start spreading the ball around. I'd like to not have the in the back of my mind that I have to go here because this is my star wide out and I need to go do that. It's like I'm good enough to move the ball around. I want to be able to just find the open guy. I want to be able to just not worry about the little things like that. And I wonder if that's where he's at. And I think that's how most NFL teams should look at building up their young quarterback is just surround as much humanly possible as much talent as humanly possible early on and then once they're settled once they're a consistent playoff team and they're just a top 10 top 15 quarterback they're like all right now we can kind of spread it around we can kind of use a resource a little bit differently we don't have to have the go-to guy for this guy because i think our floor is settled with him he knows what he's doing year over year i think mahomes is there and i think he's actually going to have that bump um theo when you have to do the one through four how many in the playoffs from this division and how do you predict the four teams finishing in this division next year? I got the chargers and the chiefs in the playoffs. Okay. And one through four, I might go chargers chiefs. And then I really feel very similarly about the Broncos and and Raiders at like nine and eight. That's Mm. where I'm at. So I'll say, Gun to my head, Chargers, Chiefs, Ooh. Raiders, Broncos. That's probably where I'm at. Broncos last. Um, and it's not because of Russ. That's the thing. I'm not even worried about Russ or the offense that much. It's mm-hmm. the front seven that I think is scary because their star pass rusher there is is Bradley Chubb. Mm-hmm. Who carries? That's a lot of star power when you say Bradley Chubb. But if I asked you how many sacks you think Bradley Chubb has over the last three years, like what what would your answer be? Hmm. The fact that you just asked me this tells me it's low. So I'm gonna guess eleven. Yeah, he was injured. Yeah. So 
It, it kind of really last three years. Eighteen, eleven. It's eight. Eight. Uh, you, eight so half. yeah, but the context of that would be that he was playing with Von Miller. He then gets Which, injured. There's there's a little context to it, but it's also like, man, you've had you've had been hurt for three years. You've been unproductive for three years. Like, yeah. if he's your guy, you know, and and there's some dudes they drafted Nick Benito who had two sacks in the last preseason game. They've converted Barry Browning off to the edge, who was an off-ball linebacker. I actually kind of liked coming out of the draft, and he's flashed this preseason. Uh, they brought in Randy Gregory, uh, but Randy Gregory's career high in sacks is like six and a half. And, you know, so it's just like they don't have very many productive pass rushers on that team. And they were one of the worst teams in terms of pressure rate last year. And it, that's kind of where I get a little worried. It's like that front seven – like you can if you're a broncos fan you're gonna look at me and be like oh you know everything's awesome like randy gregory bradley chubb the depth of the two of nick benito and and baron browning is like we're gonna be fine those are that's solid and it's like i could see that happening but i mean you're gonna need you're gonna you're also projecting career years and like late round rookies or mid-round rookies to be like very good players right away so I worry a little bit about their defense. I love Sertan. I love Justin Simmons. Um, those are like two elite players at their position. But the other cornerback spots are a little wonky. It's a first-time defensive coordinator. He's never done it before. And the Broncos brought in Dom Capers to uh, assist him. And as a Packer fan, I will tell you that Dom Capers is not the guy you want doing that. So I don't know. It's kind of an inexperienced defensive group. I worry a little bit about the front seven. I worry a little bit about Russ, but when you look at the pace he was on before he hurt his thumb, I'm not like that worried about Russ. Uh, but overall, like I'm a, just a little worried about Russ, and I'm worried about the front seven. So they're probably why. That's probably why I have them last. Uh, but again, I even still have them with a winning record. It's a stacked division. But yeah, uh, to close it out, like my thoughts just overall. Chargers, Chiefs, we'll say Raiders, Broncos. Those are my four in that order. I like it. Evan, what about you? One through four. Uh, you know, Chargers number one, Chiefs number two. Um, I think this is, you know, one of the de- one of the divisions that can absolutely send three to the playoffs. Uh, it Chiefs is going four. They have all four in the playoffs. <sighs> no, dude. Whew. <laughs> Listen, man. I could see it, man. There, it's you, a stacked division. Let, let me put it this way. And this is just how my simple little brain works. If you were to put the Raiders in, I don't know, man, in the AFC East right now. Or when that's yeah, yeah, the AFC East. Like I think that they could probably do some damage. They could they could contend against the Bills, probably win two or three games less, whatever. Sure. But they're not going – they have six games this year against three of the best teams in the NFL. Like, if it's Derek Carr or Justin Herbert, Russell Wilson, and Patrick Mahomes, I'm not I'm not rooting for Derek Carr. Derek Carr, God bless him, has been getting so much more praise over his entire career than he's ever really deserved. And I'm happy that he played well last year. I'm happy that Gruden's finally gone. A lot of bad circumstances with the Raiders. But, you know, the, the Raiders are not making the playoffs. And it's not uh, it's not that they're a bad team. They do have a very – you know, everything you guys have said about their roster is true. They've got a really good pass rush. You know, Max, those are good players. But the reality sets in week one when they have to play in a division of the Chargers – Patriot, or excuse me, the Chargers, the Chiefs, and the and the and the Broncos. I just, it's not going to happen. So I will have the Broncos as the third team and the Raiders as the fourth team. The Raiders, if it makes you feel any better, will probably be the best fourth team in their division in the NFL, and mm. I'm very happy for them. Um, I am very curious though what happens with Russ. Uh, because that's that's a huge variable that we just don't know. He came off an injury, didn't play that great in Seattle. Their team didn't make the playoffs. We think he's still Russ. I'm still terrified of the man. Who knows? I don't think he is. That's how we'll end it. Is I don't think yeah. he is. I think at 34, we've seen the best of Russ. And I don't think this is a Peyton Manning situation. I'm going to bet on this not being a Peyton situation in Denver. I think this doesn't work. So I'm going to go one 
Chiefs, two Raiders, three Chargers, four Broncos, and I think um, the Chiefs and Raiders both make the playoffs in the AFC West until I think every, it happens. Yeah, I think everybody gets a mulligan on this division. I think uh-huh. if, if it goes in the exact opposite order that you predict, it's not one like the you know nothing would shock a, us. NFC, NFC East, where like if the Giants win that division, if you or if you have the Washington Commanders winning that division, and it doesn't happen, I'm gonna be like that was a stupid prediction. This one, like, I don't, if if you think the Chargers or the Raiders or whoever's winning this division is winning the division, it doesn't happen. I'll be like, I can see why you thought that, man. Yeah. Because it's it's all of these teams are, all of these teams could win most other divisions. I feel like it's it's crazy. Theo, we can go listen to you and the great crew over there at Stay Hot uh, this week over on the sp- on uh, the Blue Wire Pod Network. Go subscribe on the YouTube page and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, where you get your podcasts, and support the good folks over there. Evan, we can follow you on Twitter at Evan Swords. Theo, Evan, thank you as always for the time, and I will talk to you all both very soon. Mm-hmm.